Anyway, Cytus Empiricus has an interpretation of the proem where he's saying um, the wheels of the chariot symbolize the ears, or the hearing faculties. The, the horses, the mares, they symbolize the irrational impulses that you have to kind of keep, keep under control. And what's keeping them under control is Dike, the goddess of justice. So every time that we see justice in these, uh, in these pre-Socratic pre uh, fragments, it's actually a goddess, Dike. And so there's a bit of a metaphor there. Uh, so the goddess holding everything in order, justice, order. Um, but in this case, Dike symbolizes the intellect. And so it's the intellect that's keeping the horses under control while as Parmenides is riding his chariot. And he's accompanied by sun maidens. And the sun maidens, according to Sexus Empiricus, symbolize the eyes. What the sun maidens do is they unveil and they lead Parmenides out of the hall of night. And this is symbolizing that he is moving from benightedness to enlightenment. And it's not just that, but it comes when he hears an anonymous goddess's voice and she's about to show him the way. And so that leads us into the second fragment, the beginning of the second part, the Aletheia where the goddess, she talks about, she says, oh, Parmenides, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna tell you about two paths, there are two ways, and the word that she uses, it will, the, it, the way that we say path in, in Greek is oldoi, uh, that's the plural, the singular would be oldos, uh, the, the strong indication that Parmenides is using the word oldos as a way of saying methodos, which means inquiry, or method, that's where we get the word method from, methodos, oldos, oldos is a path. We have similar metaphors in Chinese philosophy with the word Tao, and most famously with Taoism, but also we have it in Chinese Buddhism and Confucianism, right. and also with the school of names. Right, like the way. The way. The road. The road. But it's really a metaphor for a method or how to approach the topic. So it, a way of inquiry. Um, so, it, so she's talking about two oldoi, two methods, and. Um, she gives other indications of this as well when she talks about the right way. She cryptically refers to it as the muthos odoyo, which sounds, sounds like methodos, but what it really means is fabled path. And muthos is like myth, that's where we get the word myth. So there's a little bit of wordplay, and this is really common in ancient Greek literature, where they try to use puns and things to kind of get your mind pointing in the right direction, because they don't, they don't know where the target is, but they know the right direction. And this is, all, this is how all these myths are used to try to teach you to get just your mind on the same page as everybody else. It's not exactly a precise uh, scientific experiment that, or it's not a computer program. So anyways, um, you're talking about two paths. The right way, she refers to them by two different names as well. So she talks about Odoe, but then the right path, she calls the Keluthos, which means like road or path. The wrong way, she refers to it as the Atarpos, which is like bypass or like cutting corners or shortcut. It's like not really, at least that's how she's using it. So it's like, okay, there's a real road, that's the way, and then there's this bypath. And so I'm gonna tell you about the right way, and then I'm gonna tell you about the wrong way. And then she goes on, when she talks about the right way, she gives a few different kinds of accounts of the right way. Um, one kind of account is what we might call a phenomenological or a psychological account. And this is where she says that truth is persuasive. Uh, it's a, sometimes she, she often uses the, the phrase well persuasive. Um, in the Sexus Empiricus version of, of, the, uh, of the proem, you also find the word persuasive uh, when in reference to the right path or in reference to truth. And so the one account of the right way is that truth is persuasive. What this means is that if you encounter truth, it will persuade you. It doesn't mean that, all, it doesn't mean that only true things persuade you. You could be persuaded by absolute nonsense. But if you ever happen to encounter the truth, you will be persuaded by it question is what is the truth and how would you be able to tell the difference? So then he goes on to give a few logical accounts of the right way, certain things like truth must reflect something and it cannot reflect nothing. Um, other things like, um, well then there's an epistemological account saying that knowledge must affirm. So you don't know something if you just say what it's not. You, you don't know what a cat is just if you just understand it as not being a dog. Um, and so sometimes we think, okay, we can whittle out of this and define things very precisely without using any negative terms, but what about when it comes to something and nothing, or truth and falsity? How do you understand truth if you only understand it as not falsity? How do you understand falsity if you only understand it as not truth? And how other way would you understand either of them? Same thing with something and nothing. 
Nothing is not something. Something is not nothing. But if that's how you understand either of them at a fundamental level, you don't under you don't know anything about either. So you come away knowing nothing about nothing nor something. And so you have to you have to express it in a positive sense. And so this leads him to a very bizarre methodological account where I think that there's a little bit of a code in the words he's using. And um, this is where I I think it, my position gets very controversial, is because there's when he gets to the part about the sphere, and he's talking about well-rounded truth, and I'm, I'm not convinced that he's actually talking about being in that respect. And the reason that I think this is because in the poem, whenever he uses roundness, he's either using it with truth or with sound, some reference to sound. So it's either the sound of the goddess's voice, or it's either the sound of the wheels of the chariot. Those things are either true or round. Um, roundness is also always put. Roundness is always put next to truth. There's, yeah, well-rounded truth is a phrase that, that comes up again and again in the poem. It's you eo kukleos, kukleos like cycle. Eo like means well, well-rounded. So it's either well-rounded truth or it's either uh, the round wheels of the chariot, right? And the round wheels of the chariot they're taking him in the direction of truth. Um, so this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. This this. What I want to call it the code in the Parmenides with how they're using roundness, sound, and truth together. And I think that actually Plato later on solves this problem for us and it explains in a way how this all fits together. Um, but if I could move on to the, the wrong way and explain what makes it the wrong way, because so far what we have with the right way is that knowledge must affirm something, truth must reflect something, and not nothing. It doesn't leave us with much of an idea of what truth is or what the right way is. And so she later talks about the wrong way. And the, the wrong way is the way of moral opinion. And that's the way of that's the way that most of us go through life, which is that we believe that some things are true and some things are false. And so or that there's something versus nothing. And he's trying to say that really you can't say that anything you might be able to say there, there might be true things, there definitely are true things, but certainly there is nothing false. Because when we say something false, we're saying that it's nothing. We're saying that it refers to nothing. And what would, what would falsity refer to? Because if we say that truth reflects something, then falsity would have to reflect nothing. But nothing can't exist, and so falsity can't reflect anything. And so what would falsity be? So you would end up getting rid of the concept of falsity, but you can keep the concept of truth, because truth reflects something, and something has to be. So he gets rid of falsity, and he's left with a logic that only has truth. But then he doesn't really leave us with much to go. And Plato, in a way, I don't, I don't know if it depends on your perspective, Plato criticizes him for it or Plato clarifies this for us. Because Plato says that this way, he says it in, he says it in the Parmenides dialogue and he says it in his Sophist dialogue in two different ways. But he says that if we follow this way, we end up being, we, we can't say anything false because there's no, falsity doesn't exist. But we can't say anything true either, even though truth exists. And it's because none of our concepts will really hold up under weight. Because so many of our concepts come in opposition to other concepts. You know, our, our, our colors, you know, a color is not this color, not that color, but we can never really establish what a color is. And so all of our speech, we can never say anything true. And this is Plato's critique or clarification. And I think that um, he, he goes, I, I think this is more of a clar clarification than a critique because when Plato, in, in Plato's dialogue, the sophist, the, they say, okay, we're gonna talk about the sophist. What is a sophist? We're gonna define a sophist. We're gonna define a politician or a statesman. And then we're gonna define a philosopher. And he writes a dialogue, the sophist. Then he writes a dialogue called the statesman. He never writes a dialogue called the philosopher. And there are many, there are many different theories about why he never wrote it. Maybe he never got around to it. Maybe he deliberately didn't write it. Um, and I, I agree, I think he did, he deliberately did not write it. The question is why? I think he deliberately did not write it because I think that following Parmenides, he's saying there's no such thing as falsity and you can't say anything true. Then what is a philosopher left to do? And this is actually what Socrates asks Parmenides in the Parmenides dialogue that Plato wrote. What are we left to do if we can't, if we can't use any of these concepts if speech just breaks down? And I think that if, the answer to the question is why he never wrote the philosopher. Because the philosopher will never say anything. The 
philosopher just listens. And as soon as you say something, you're already running into nonsense because you're never going to hit truth. And maybe truth is just what we can hear. We have to listen to truth. But not listen with our senses, listen in some other sense. And I, I think that this is why he uses from the very beginning roundness, the round chariot's wheels symbolizing the ears, round and sound. And then it's well-rounded truth, round and truth. And then it's, and then we have um, the goddess's voice that reveals the word of truth. And the only way that you're going to get this message is through your divine revelation. Because a mortal can never say anything true, and there's nothing false that can be said that doesn't exist. That sounds like Socrates. This is, I, I think this is where Plato is getting it all from. And so I'm, I'm, this is very controversial theory, but, um, well, okay, so, okay, this actually brings me to the, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up, but this brings me to um, the way of, of the doxa, right? So the third part, the third part of the poem is Can the doxa. Can you write that down for us, please? The doxa? Yeah, this one. Um, yeah, the doxa. We're going to be talking about this one, okay? The doxa. The doxa, doxa is a belief or opinion. Here, I'll put it, opinion. Uh, again, excuse me, from Greek, dokeo means to seem, to appear. It seems to me to be the case. It appears to me. So again, seeming. Sometimes it's called the way of seeming, depending on the edition. Like, right. The one I have is, is a way of belief. Others, I've seen opinion, I've seen seem. And because it, it, these words, they, they're never going to translate perfectly, but this is generally, it's clearly not knowledge. This is clearly Correct. not the right path. And, Correct. Correct. You know, here's the thing. So what's very interesting about this is that it's a, it's a demonstration. It's a, okay, it's actually a sham cosmology. It's meant to be, it's like, look, all you hear all these creation stories, all these different theories about how the universe works. They're all, they all have something in common in that they're all nonsense, and they're all nonsense in the same way, and I'll show you how, because I can come up with my own story of how the world began, and on the same false premises. And so he begins with night and day, and how night and day combine, and they both share in being, and he goes on. But the thing is, is, night and day symbolize truth and falsity, and he gives indications of this in the proem, and in other parts, uh, in between the proem and the doxa. So, why, why is this important that night and day symbolize truth and falsity? Because, well, light, truth, uh, you know, night, falsity, you're in the dark, enlightenment, benightedness. Uh, but on top of that, he's trying to show, look, all of these sham cosmologies are sham because they start with truth and falsity. And I just showed you how we can never have something called falsity. You're just left with truth. And it would have to, that would have to be the one that would account for everything. But he's saying there's no falsity. There's no nighttime. It's just daytime. But you start off with this theory of reality of night and day, of truth and falsity, of something and nothing. But there's nothing cannot be. Night cannot be. It's all one. And so that's basically what the rest of and the rest of that sham cosmology is making references to different pre-Socratic theories of reality. So going back to the next commander, and a lot of it is like poking fun at them. Uh, Plato, I believe, does something very, very similar in his Sophist, where the first half is basically like the way of truth, where he's trying to show, he's basically making the case for Parmenides. He even quotes verbatim two lines from the seventh fragment of Parmenides in his Sophist. And he makes this whole case how falsity cannot be. This is a book, about a third of the dialogue in Sophist is all about that, how nothing can, it's just reiterating Parmenides. And then suddenly he, makes, he takes this logical leap of faith and starts his own sham cosmology saying that, oh, truth and falsity both share in differentness. And then from that, we build it all up. And he, he goes on making a very similar case, but it's much more subtle in Plato than it is in Parmenides. And I think that it will, everything I just said is really controversial because this is something that's debated. Not everybody, not everybody will agree that Plato was doing a sham cosmology. Many people will think that he was actually trying to refute Parmenides in order to save his theory of forms. But here's the thing. I don't think that he particularly was out to save his theory of forms. First of all, in his Parmenides, he makes an argument that destroys his theory of forms using the Eleatic method, using the whole Parmenidean philosophy. He 
destroys the theory of forms, and he leaves it. He leaves it at that, saying, "Well, if we don't have the theory of forms, then we can't say anything true." He's just reiterating the Parmenidean point, and this comes up again in the Sophist. What's very interesting, though, is that if you ever thought that, oh, well, maybe Plato solved the problem later, found a way to defend the theory of forms. I don't think so, and the reason I don't think so is because the exact same argument he uses against what's supposedly his own theory of forms shows up again in Aristotle's sophistical refutations and metaphysics, the exact same argument for the exact same reason. And so if Plato had come up with some brilliant defense of the theory of forms, you would expect Aristotle to have addressed it. But instead, Aristotle's way of addressing it is by using Plato's very own argument against his very own theory of forms. So what is this? What does this suggest about um, a lot of our understandings of Plato, um, of Socrates, of Aristotle? And what was Aristotle's project if we take this theory seriously? Um, what would it mean to say that falsity is nonsense and that um, you can't say anything true even though truth must be? And what does that leave philosophy, which is the question that Plato, well, through Socrates, asked a fictional Parmenides? So um, I think that in many ways this does leave us with mysticism and very little left to say. And maybe the moral of the Eliotic philosophy is that truth is just by listening to nature and the world around us. So that's all I have to say about Parmenides. <laughs>